The question of the day is, with all the injustices, the harassment, and the aggression that we see toward black people every day, do you feel unsafe around white people? <laughs> Drop your thoughts, and we will read them throughout the show. So, I mean, it's, it's a provocative yeah. thing to, to think about, given all that's going on in the news. And I feel like the last couple of days, particularly as people who talk about social justice, y'all have to be really wrestling with not just that question, but in general, like, where are we right now on a social justice front? I think that um, we're at a point in our history um, that, you know, I, I'd say for those of us on set, that we haven't seen in our lives in terms of the... Um, the amount of awareness, the fact that people are constantly mm -hmm. talking about these issues. You know, most of us were, we were raised in, you know, the 80s and the 90s, mm -hmm. uh, Mark in the 70s. And <laughs> <laughs> Shots fired. Yeah. And that we're was, off. I that usually was do early. that. that was yeah. I like it. <laughs> We've got a show. You know, yeah. <laughs> but, but again, that people got comfortable, people got complacent, people yeah. were dealing with the challenges of the crack era, yeah. you know, and we're not necessarily looking at the laws mm -hmm. that were be, being put into place right. uh, to do us harm. And, and people were thinking about capitalism and individual success as opposed to collective struggle and work. Yeah. Um, and thanks to you know social media and platforms like uh, the ones that we've all contributed to over the years and the work of people like Rashad, it's inescapable. Yes, mm -hmm. it's inescapable. And you know, I think the challenge that we're facing is that um, because there's so much uh, presence of those issues, we can mistake that for change actually right. happening. Mm. Because, you know, we something gets so many retweets or it's on the news and people are talking about it, we can mistake that presence for power. Wow. And power, you know, for us at Color of Change, we talk about as the ability to change the rules. Right. And if the rules are not changing, whether they are written rules of policy or unwritten rules of culture, we can be in a position where it almost works against us having all this hyper-visibility around these issues because the status quo can be kind of almost fait complete. Like, we can almost think, like, well, there was no justice for Sandra Bland. There was no justice for Trayvon Martin. There was no justice for Mike Brown. That is how it can, it's supposed to be. It's almost a dance. Something bad happens. There's outrage. And so I do think, like, um, strategically, we have to continue to up our game right. about who we hold accountable, what enablers are not allowed to sort of occupy um, comfortable space when these things happen, um, whose um, kind of comfort is upended um, until justice is served. And unless we are doing those things, unfortunately, um, I think that the visibility alone um, actually can be a detriment to our ability to What visibility? Change. What do you mean? The visibility of us, um, the access to more information, right? You know, 10, 15 years ago, when these moments of policing would happen, we didn't actually get um, real-time stories about it, right? So sometimes I'm on news programs or places where it's like, is there... Is our, you know, is it real? Is it is police and community interaction worse than it was before? And I'm like, no. We just actually know more things than we did before. Um, you know, I hear the stories from my father and my grandfather, and even think about like my own upbringing, where something would happen and there would be no news about it. Right. There would be no information about it. So yes, because of some of the social media platforms, we've been able to bypass traditional media gatekeepers and go directly to the source. And that type of visibility has helped more people get activated, has helped uprisings happen. But without change and without rule change, um, uh, the status quo can get baked in and become even stronger. Absolutely. No, that, that's what scares me, you yeah. know, is that people, we have the illusion of change. Yes. And, and as the 2020 elections come in, there's going to be a lot more of that. By the way, uh, we have some uh, social media comments coming in. We're going to get to them in a little bit. I want to make sure that everybody, uh, you know, again, answers that question. What does it mean to live in a world where you might actually think that... Uh, that, that you're not safe around white people. Right. And, and to really wrestle with that, because I feel like that's something that we're not allowed to wrestle with as black people. It's right. that question we don't even raise to ourselves. It, it, it's something that I think some of us were raised to, to think about our safety yeah. around white people. And it's not, you know, you, you've heard old black mama say things like, don't you embarrass me in front of these white folks. Yeah. You know, this, and, and it sounds on its face like, oh, are you saying we have to have a better standard of behavior or decorum when we're in the presence of these people? Are we mm -hmm. trying to... Um, you know, humanize ourselves by being respectable, but it, it, it's more so a function of mm -hmm. what happens when we're disruptive, right, in, in a space with people who do not recognize or believe in our humanity. You know, how somebody could have the police called on them for, you know, an argument or, or for doing something that 
somebody else can do, you know, in public without it becoming an issue or yeah. just simply being present in certain spaces, right? Mm -hmm. The police are going to be called on you. And yes, we've had all these viral videos of that in recent years, but, you know, Pool Park pa uh, Pamela or whatever yes. cute name people want to give her, that stuff has been going on right. since day one, since there have been police to call on black people. Right. Black people have had the police called mm -hmm. on them, you know? So we've never been safe in the presence of white people. There is an increased um, likelihood of police interaction you know, because the idea that we're unsafe and that they have to be protected mm -hmm. from us, there's the idea that somebody can challenge your ability to just simply exist in a space or actually do you harm, mm -hmm. right? Or, or physically, it's so many of them, and I hate to say, you know, white people, they're just so bad, all the white people. No, it's not that, but the number of white folks that feel comfortable policing the us themselves. Right. It's not just about calling law enforcement. It's someone saying, what are you doing here? Mm -hmm. Right? Why? You know, or your music is too loud. Right. right. Which is what we saw in the case of Jordan Davis. Right. We see it in all, all these other cases. And like you said, it's happened for a long time. There's a case uh, that I do want to talk about, Elijah... Uh, Elamine. Elijah Elamine, right? I mean, this is the case of a 17-year-old boy who was essentially uh, stalked right. yeah. and harassed. He's at, he's, at, he's at a vending machine trying to get a snack, and there's uh, a, a, a white assailant who, who cuts his neck. He he hates he hates black people. He yeah. hates I mean, he hates every, he essentially hated every he hates vulnerable gay group, he hates gay people, black people, hip hop music, hip -hop right. music. and he decides to just go out and kill a black a black person. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of vulnerability is something you can't even predict. Or I mean, you're just walking down the street. Mm -hmm. You know, when you see snacks, right? Yeah, and. and, and other folks have told their children not to, don't let that person get too close to you, right? right. The idea of, you know, you see a white woman in an elevator, any of us, not just you two, yeah. right? You get on an elevator with a white woman, there's a good chance she's gonna clutch her purse, right. or she's gonna press mm -hmm. the button, you know, mm -hmm. or she's gonna pick mm -hmm. up her pace walking down the street, it's particularly at night, you know, if you're behind her. But we have to, you know, think about those things too, and I think many of us do, but a lot of us, you know, I, I just see the, the ways that we're comfortable. We trust that, you know, they're not gonna pick up your laptop or your phone if you leave it at a coffee yeah. shop, you know, that they can yeah. get right behind you or get really close to you. I think about the times that white women and men, you know, will get in my physical space as if I'm invisible. Yeah. You know, almost like they're trying to yeah. walk through me. And I just think to myself, now if a black man, or even me, you know, a, a tall black woman got this close to you, you would be so uncomfortable, you would be so afraid. And so now the idea that a 17 year old you know, who, who's thinking, if I see a 17-year-old at a vending machine, my first thought is, I hope he has enough money, and if he, for his snacks, yeah. if he doesn't, maybe yeah. I need to reach for my person. Right. You know, you're going to auntie mode. I'm yeah. going into <laughs> cool big sister mode, right? right? And so... <laughs> auntie, uh, <laughs> auntie. <laughs> 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 